Hello info person, this is Anton and today we're going to discuss some of the more unusual discoveries about our own sun. Because turns out our star, the sun, has been acting just a little bit different in just the last few years. And so in this video we're going to focus on some of the more bizarre discoveries about the sun's behavior, mostly things that scientists didn't expect, and of course discuss what this means for us right here on planet Earth. And a lot of these discoveries are essentially just the discrepancies between what scientists predicted the sun should be doing and how it should be acting during its 25th solar cycle, compared to what's actually being detected and compared to what we're observing since the sun became super active in the last three years. And so I guess to start, let's briefly discuss these solar cycles and what we usually expect pretty much every 11 years. And I think this graph right here kind of explains everything. Roughly every 11 years the sun goes from being somewhat calm and I guess somewhat sleepy, the phase we refer to as the solar minimum, to a very chaotic, very fiery phase referred to as the solar maximum. And this very active solar maximum is usually defined by the amount of sunspots we see on the surface because they normally represent a lot of magnetic activity on the surface and very often result in very powerful storms. And so we actually even have this map going back several centuries showing us the overall sunspot observations and showing us certain minima and certain maxima even when it comes to decades long periods. For example right here during the 1600s and 1700s there was something known as the Monder minimum when for some reason, that's still not really clear to us, the sun seemed to have almost no sunspots on the surface. Whereas since the mid-1800s, there was something known as the modern maximum, when the sun generally became much more active and produced a lot of sunspots every 11 years. But based on these observations, and based on I guess this graph right here, a lot of NASA researchers and a lot of solar scientists predicted the solar cycle 25 to be relatively mild. And that's because compared to solar cycle 22, 23 was weaker, 24 was even weaker, and so 25 was expected to be really weak. But not all scientists agreed with this, and as we discussed in one of the videos in the description, there was actually a slightly different proposition based on even larger cycles, something we're going to discuss in a few minutes, that predicted the opposite. At least one study predicted cycle 25 to be super powerful. And guess what? Most solar scientists were basically incorrect and that one study turned out to be almost spot on. The 2025 solar maximum first of all arrived much sooner and second of all was way more powerful than expected. And you can see how it differed from the predicted values in this graph. And so here both NASA and NOAA, the two big space agencies, officially confirmed that we're now in the solar maximum and the cycle seems to be one of the strongest in the recent memory. As a matter of fact, based on the number of sunspots, it dramatically exceeded previous predictions and actually exceeded initial forecasts for 30 months in a row. And even in August of 2025, the average daily sunspot count was the highest in almost 23 years, more than double what was predicted. As a matter of fact, the initial prediction by NOAA suggested that on July 2025 we should see approximately 115 sunspots, similar to cycle 24, but the real number was double. With the average number of sunspots since 2019, when the solar cycle started, being at least 33% higher compared to cycle 24 and compared to what's predicted. And this is on top of extremely strong solar flares and several coronal mass ejections, which as you probably know already produced a lot of beautiful aurora in the last few years. Once again we've discussed one of the biggest such storms in one of the videos in 2024. And so here we had multiple X-class flares, multiple geomagnetic storms, and way more than predicted. And we actually currently have no idea how many more we're going to experience until the end of the cycle in 2030. And this is really the important part because apart from surging sunspots, this also involves a lot of potentially powerful flares. Basically bright flashes of light and a lot of radiation coming from the sunspots, which very often interact with the ionosphere and can cause radio blackouts, disrupt satellite communication and can deform the Earth's upper atmosphere and obviously also produce quite a lot of radiation danger for astronauts and various satellites. And the most powerful flares are referred to as the X-class flares. And even this year we already had 11. With the total number of all types of flare dramatically increased from around 400 in 2020 to nearly 3000 now. And not only are there more sunspots, some of them seem to be really massive. For example one of them, AR3354, the sunspot you see captured right here, was essentially 10 times wider than our own planet 
and formed in just 48 hours. And these gigantic sunspots are also very often linked to very powerful geomagnetic storms or coronal mass ejections. And it's really the powerful CMEs that very often affect us here on planet Earth. These are essentially really large discharges coming from the sun, very often caused by the snapping of the magnetic fields, when huge amounts of clouds of charged particles blast into outer space and then travel toward various planets. And though CMEs by themselves are usually not that dangerous, in some cases, especially when several happen all at once, this is when we sometimes get enormous geomagnetic storms, such as the one that shut down my home province of Quebec in 1987. And what's more, during this cycle, researchers have also identified what we usually refer to as cannibal CMEs. These are essentially multiple CMEs where one of them overtakes and then swallows the other one, eventually creating an even bigger and more powerful storm that then heads toward planet Earth. And intriguingly enough, a few months back, the Parker Solar Probe, the probe whose purpose is to investigate the Sun, literally flew right through one of these, capturing a lot of data and revealing everything we feared about them. They seem to be ridiculously powerful, and if one of them heads toward planet Earth, we can essentially expect something similar to a Carrington event once again. But luckily for us, nothing like this happened yet. Although since the cycle is still going on, there's still a chance it might happen. But during the cycle, researchers have also seen a lot of really bizarre structures around the Sun, some which we've never seen before. Now most of these are usually referred to as prominences, but in this case, a lot of them were absolutely enormous. For example, one of the more bizarre ones was referred to as the Beast. A gigantic cloud of shape-shifting plasma, approximately 13 times the size of our own planet, that hovered over the Sun for several hours. This was actually one of the biggest such events ever observed, and obviously still has no explanation. On top of this, we've also seen several incredible formations such as the solar tornadoes, many of which have been so far the largest we've ever seen. At least one of them was 14 times the size of the planet. And though these have been seen before, during this cycle there seem to be way too many, and they seem to be much larger. On top of this, this time scientists have also noticed that there seems to be some kind of a massive polar vortex forming around the northern pole of the sun, and this vortex lasted for 8 hours, representing a massive storm. And then there was this beautiful picture of the plasma waterfall. This was about 60,000 miles high, or about 100,000 kilometers from top to bottom. And all of these were captured in just the last two years and were a strong indicator that the sun seems to have reached its maximum and is way, way more active than we've seen ever. Now, obviously, this is because we have so many more observatories and so many more means of capturing the sun, but this doesn't change the fact that the sun is super, super active right now. And so the question is, what exactly does this mean for Earth? Well, the most obvious consequence is going to be even more aurora for at least two more years. We're going to be seeing more and more aurora in regions that haven't seen aurora for a very long time, and even in places much closer to the equator than usual. This is of course what happened in 2024, and might happen again really soon. Likewise, there are going to be more unusual phenomena such as eerie air glow. This usually creates very slow moving rivers of green and red, and though it usually looks like aurora, is technically a different phenomenon. This aero glow comes from the sun's more gradual radiation and is a kind of a natural emission of light by the Earth's upper atmosphere that basically increases when the sun is more active. But it's not just about visual effects, it's also about atmospheric effects as well. For example, we expect less noctilucent clouds. These are rare sparkly night shining clouds that you might have seen in the past, but we expect a lot less of them because the increased solar radiation warms the upper atmosphere and reduces the amount of water vapor required for these clouds to form. Naturally, this also affects the reflectivity of the planet and thus affects the weather and the climate, but exactly how, we are not sure yet. But we do expect things to warm up just a little bit, because normally these clouds reflect solar radiation, making the atmosphere just a little bit cooler. And because the Earth's upper atmosphere or thermosphere is being heated up, it's also going to expand just a little bit, and this expansion creates more drag for satellites, especially the ones in the low Earth orbit, which basically gives them more drag and sometimes may cause them to fall back to Earth. This is exactly what happened with the 38 Starlink satellites during a geomagnetic storm in 2022. But I guess the question is, so why exactly is all of this happening, and what do we know or what have we learned about the Sun in the last few years? Well, here we have some studies that do help us understand the Sun a little bit better, but there are no real answers yet. Although we do have some really exciting propositions that we're going to discuss in a couple of minutes. Now, as always, you can find all of these studies 
in the links in the description below. But in essence, it seems to be all the result of bizarre magnetic effects somewhere on the solar surface. For example, in one of the recent studies, scientists tackled a magnetic reconnection mystery that has now been officially confirmed by the Parker Solar Probe. And so for decades, scientists theorized that solar flares and coronal mass ejections mostly get all of their energy from something called magnetic reconnection. This is basically when the magnetic lines very often formed around the solar spots, break apart and then reconnect in a slightly different arrangement. And this ends up releasing huge amounts of energy and produces these powerful burps referred to as CMEs, coronal mass ejections. But the problem is that nobody has ever seen it physically, or at least we had no direct data pretty much until now. And so based on the Parker Solar Probe observations, which flew really close to the Sun, here by flying through the regions where these explosive processes were occurring, this confirmed this 70-year-old theory. This was a direct observation of the reconnection, helping scientists understand this process a little bit better, which will hopefully create better models in order to predict powerful storms. But there was also a discovery of something that was not expected. The question of where exactly does the Sun produce its magnetic field? And this is because in previous propositions, this was assumed to be somewhere deep inside, possibly over 200,000 kilometers below the surface. But some of the new computer simulations and some of the new data from the Parker Solar Probe suggested that this seems to be not true. It seems to be very close to the surface, possibly only 20,000 to 30,000 kilometers deep, and seems to be the result of very powerful cyclical plasma flows very close to the surface which will hopefully once again help us create better models for future predictions. Additional studies also tackled the idea behind the strange rotation of the Sun, in this case because the solar rotation is actually different on the poles compared to the equator. The equator usually rotates faster, taking approximately 24 days per rotation, whereas the poles rotate every 34 days with this new theory suggesting that the long period sound waves very deep inside the Sun, the sound waves that actually cause a lot of the convection, seem to play a major role in controlling the rotation and thus controlling what happens on the surface, including a lot of these magnetic interactions. Or just to rephrase this, a lot of the activity on the surface seems to be the result of very powerful acoustic oscillations deep inside the Sun. And so all of these powerful sound waves seem to transport the heat from the poles to the equator influencing the spin of the Sun and producing all of these emissions on the surface. You can learn more about how we actually hear the Sun and how these acoustic oscillations are usually detected from one of the videos in the description. But obviously the biggest mystery is, so why exactly is the Sun so much more powerful than predicted? And why is there so much more solar wind? Because apart from having more activity, the Sun's constant outflow of particles, referred to as the solar wind, has also been getting much stronger since 2008. And this was once again really unexpected. Mostly because once again earlier predictions suggested that the Sun should be headed for less activity and actually a prolonged phase of low activity with very low solar wind. And so here by measuring the solar wind in terms of speed, density, temperature and magnetic field strength, researchers confirmed that it's indeed getting much stronger. But much more importantly, this also suggests that measuring solar activity in just sound spots may not be entirely correct. We may need to look at other solar activity and combine it to create a much bigger picture. And here we have at least one study and at least one hypothesis that tries to tackle and explain what's possibly happening here. Or technically this is maybe two propositions because this involves two different cycles that are slightly less known. For example, in solar physics there is something known as the Hale's Law and Hale Cycle. The idea that the solar cycle is not just 11 years long, it's also 22 years long, comprising two consecutive 11-year cycles. And that's because during a single cycle the Sun flips its polarity, with the South becoming North and vice versa, and so in order to return to the original position, it essentially needs two cycles. But more importantly, there is a much longer 100-year cycle, referred to as CGC, Centennial Gleisberg Cycle. And it just so happens that several studies published in 2024 and 2025 suggested that the cycle might have just restarted, possibly explaining the intensity of solar activity and the intensity of the solar wind. And so here, if this cycle is ramping up, Earth could experience decades of heightened solar activity, potentially posing a lot of risk to satellites, astronauts and global technology, and of course producing a lot of beautiful aurora. And so based on what we know about this cycle, it's potentially anywhere from 80 to 100 years long and seems to be characterized by long-term fluctuations in solar activity, which usually then interacts with the 11-year cycle and the 22-year Hale cycle. 
with the studies in this case suggesting that the quiet sunspot cycle 24, which ended in 2020, corresponded to the CGC minimum. Basically making this the end of the cycle, which is why 2020 was so calm in terms of solar activity. And so here the assumption is that now the cycle restarted. And that means that cycle 26 and cycle 27 might be even more powerful, as the sun might experience even more activity for decades to come. And the maximum in this case is only going to be reached in approximately 40 to 50 years during the cycle 28, which might be the most powerful yet. With studies predicting the solar activity to be at least twice as intense as in 2025. And as always, if you want to learn more, check out the study in the description. There's actually a couple of them, and both of them suggest the same thing. They essentially suggest that the cycle is now restarting, and that we're going to have more and more activity for decades and decades to come. But for us here on Earth, this might not be an issue. It would just be an issue for all of these mega constellations and all of these massive satellite swarms. Since this is going to result in atmospheric swelling and a lot of space radiation, this is mostly going to be dangerous for astronauts and satellites. But we still have to be a little bit cautious because in this case, we don't really know what's going to happen and the data is very limited with the facts remaining poorly understood. And so once we have more data in the next few years, we might get a much clearer picture and maybe predict the solar activity for the next few years a little bit better because our sun is still super mysterious and we still don't really understand it that well. Which means that we'll come back and discuss most of this in some of the future videos. And we'll definitely come back and discuss additional studies in the videos sometimes in the next few weeks. And that means you should probably subscribe if you'd like to find out more. Until then, thank you for watching. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support the channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads, and can DM me directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access. Alternatively, you can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.